Hi, I'm Michael Coyle from Colgate's Department of English, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Jane Pynchon. And we have with us today a distinguished visitor, Susan Stanford Friedman, the Virginia Woolf Professor of English and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so it's good to be here. It's good to have you here. Um, we've asked you to, to come to Colgate to talk with us about several things. We're in the midst of one of our, what, Jane, every 10 years we revise the core program. Mm -hmm. And global engagements is, is on the table. But I have more selfish reasons for inviting you because you've been my teacher since I was the new kid on the block, <laughs> um, teaching me and a whole generation of modernist scholars about um, modernist writers and poets who'd almost been lost, principally H.D. and I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about her as well. Um, and maybe we begin there. Should, should we do that? Begin yeah. with H.D. and, and uh, Helen in Egypt and, and mm -hmm. some sense of uh, your bringing H.D. to the attention of uh, so, so many readers. Uh, why you, what you feel about uh, how her voice was, if not silenced, at least mm -hmm. not uh, a dominant voice. Uh, un until really, would you say the 70s? The, the, yes. Yeah. So. Or even after. Yeah. <laughs> even after. <laughs> Maybe it would help if I tried to recreate a little bit what the atmosphere of graduate school was like in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I was not required to read a single woman writer to get a PhD in English. And I got my degree in 1973. And uh, no exams, no courses on any women writers, not any of the great 19th century uh, writers of Brontes, George Eliot, Jane Austen, none of them taught mm -hmm. or required um, at that time. And I had found HD because I had a professor of poetry, um, Larry Dembo, who uh, loved philosophy and literature, actually, that interface of philosophy and literature, and he taught modernist poetry. And he taught some HD, and he wrote about HD, and he didn't work with the images poetry. He didn't work with the early short poems. He worked with trilogy. That's really unusual, I know. And Helen in Egypt. So I was introduced, actually, to her by a male professor who took her seriously and uh, read her in conjunction with uh, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, um, William Carlos Williams, Hart Crane is in that tradition. and and kind of took for granted that she was an interesting poet. She had was addressing the same kind of questions that these men were addressing. Um, Could I ask, how was yeah. that even possible? What of her texts were in print in the mid-70s? Um, uh, trilogy and um, mm -hmm. Helen and Egypt were in print. Thanks to New Directions. Mm -hmm. in, in the 1960s. And Larry actually edited a special issue of the journal he edited, um, uh, called Contemporary Literature in 1969, mm -hmm. edited this issue on HD. So, and I was a student in the 1960s, so that's how I got introduced to HD, and I had been an undergraduate Greek major <laughs> at Swarthmore <laughs> College. Yeah. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> And I uh, loved, uh, and still love, classical Greek literature, yeah. and so I felt very at home. Mm -hmm. in her poetry. I had no idea that I was gravitating towards her work because she was a woman. That, that category simply didn't exist but, in the, in, but in, as in the 1960s. Work, but as your work on her expanded, yes. that sense of all those things that would draw you yes. to her because she is a woman. Absolutely. Uh, would if, you speak to some of them? Do, uh, you know, the well, Helen in Egypt, just even as subject, is is, you know, well, it is the, the, the reconceiving of the notion of Helen uh, in her own voice. I mean, it's, there's so many things to, to think through, but what, what drew you yeah. to? Well, I think that I first developed a sense of her contest with Freud. Yeah. Um, I was going to have just a little section of the dissertation on tribute to Freud on her experience of psychoanalysis, but she has this... Um, interesting refrain in the book, the professor was always right. And then she says, but the professor wasn't always right. <laughs> and uh, so I became kind of fascinated. How could a man whose ideas about women, women's sexuality, women's identity, whose ideas were very uh, patriarchal, conventional, traditional for Vienna, how could he have liberated mm 
a woman poet to discover her creativity. And, and that this seems like a huge mystery to me. And this um, is Freud at 77 when she's 40. Yes. I mean, it's just... Um, how so, could that be? I mean, so I really started out with this, this sense of puzzle, and what, what became clearer and clearer to me is that that experience with Freud um, in many ways duplicated uh, creative women's experience with the great traditions of culture. Uh -huh. uh, and that um, women couldn't simply reject it, it was part of them. Right. They were, and in many cases, very excited by it. Women love Shakespeare, uh, Virginia Woolf loved Shakespeare, mm -hmm. right? But she had this sense of um, this burning question, why are there no women Shakespeare's? Mm -hmm. uh, so, there's, so that women, uh, many women, I think, um, and I learned this through HD, developed a kind of dialogic relationship, a kind of give and take, back and forth relationship with the great traditions, um, which both inspired them and also left them out. Uh, and so, um, it, in, in coming to understand that with H.D. and Freud, it became easier to understand what she was doing in Helen in Egypt, is that she, there was this myth that Helen never went to Troy, um, and that she had been secreted into Egypt, uh, and that she was not the great cause of the Trojan War. Um, and so she took that myth and creates uh, a whole sense of there's another way to tell the story of the Trojan War, and not just Homer's way, um, mm -hmm. but to tell it um, as feminists of the period like to quote an Emily Dickinson poem, tell the truth but tell it slant. <laughs> just create a new standpoint <clears throat> from which to look at the same stories and in the process revision them. So that, that I was at the same time very involved in the women's movement as an activist and my training was entirely within a male tradition and kind of male framework and it was um, I had no idea how to bring those two together. It was very, very schizophrenic. And I think uh, it took me a long time to do the dissertation on HD, and it was very difficult to do, but what was happening was the integration of uh, sort of the feminist movement, the ferment of the 1960s, all the questions we asked mm -hmm. in those periods of every kind of authority to gradually bring it into my academic work. I'm wondering, so you're, you've been describing HD's complex relationship with Freud and and that is a model for the relation of women poets and writers to the tradition and and perhaps contemporary readers and, and students mm -hmm. to to the tradition does that have something to do with the really unusual formal aspects of Helen and Egypt the prose and the and the poetry alternating oh. sequences mm -hmm. is that where that comes from I think that I think that's a very astute comment um, I think that HD uh, never heard a single voice, that she always heard at least double, if not multiple, mm -hmm. and that uh, she needed different ways of writing in order to represent that. Um, I think also that she was writing prose the entire time she was writing poetry. And the, the my second book on HD, uh, attention. Penelope's Web. That's the central question: is why, what, what kind of a person was she? What kind of a writer was she when she wrote in poetry? And then, what kind of a writer was she when she wrote prose? And what's what is it that can be said in prose? That can't be said in poetry. And what can be said in poetry? That can't be said in prose. And loosely, <laughs> what do you conclude? I mean, that is well. I'm sure it's different for different writers. But um, for HD. But for HD um, the 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 prose was the story of the self and the world. Mm -hmm. She could write openly about issues of sexuality, about um, war and gender, mm -hmm. um, and in the poetry, it's mythologized. Uh, mm -hmm. So she she has said at one point that the figure of Theseus in Helen in Egypt, to whom a battered Helen goes to talk, the Theseus is a mythologized version of Freud. And that when Helen uh, come, <laughs> comes through the snow in tatters and in grief to talk to Theseus, that this is a representation of H.D. going to Vienna in 1933, uh, knowing that another terrible war is coming, being already devastated even before it happened, mm -hmm. and what another war would bring, and needing to fortify herself um, against the violence that was was coming. Um, so she she tell it, it she could tell these very personal stories through through myth. Mm 
Um, and what, so the poetry in some, in some ways appears to be um, out of this world. It's, it's in a mythic realm. And I think it's what led many people to say, well, H.G. was just an escapist. She, she couldn't really face the modern world, so she wrote about classical Greece. But I think that the, um, what happens in poetry is that poetry becomes a mask, a distanced discourse in which you can deal with the personal. But it was never enough for her because she kept writing this prose, too. And, and so gradually, I think, in her later work, um, uh, the personal story of the of the battered self in a world perpetually at war um, comes into the poetry um, in a way that it didn't in the nineteen in the teens and the twenties and even the thirties it did by Helen in Egypt and and her last poem she was I'm writing. So, I'm so drawn to w want to ask you about war and 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 yeah. and how she. Con thought about war and, yeah. and felt about war, more, more almost mm -hmm. uh, equally the opposite. But could you talk a little bit about sexuality and the, the, the sense of um, openness and prose in terms of sexuality and, and, mm -hmm. and what she brings uh, to the table in terms of our mm -hmm. reconceiving of, of mm -hmm. uh, sexuality? Well, she was writing in the 1920s, she was writing these, these, these novels that she didn't publish. Um, so she wrote about openly about sexuality, about her bisexuality, her her both lesbian and heterosexual desire, and the move, the oscillation back and forth between them. She wrote very openly and very directly about it, and then didn't publish it. So whereas Virginia Woolf tended to code that, right. so that only savvy readers knew what was going on, H. D. wrote it more directly and then didn't publish it. Um, so this stuff didn't become available until the 1970s. But, for example, in the, in the novel Her, uh, which is autobiographical... But, but not in the way that, say, Forster himself wouldn't have Morris, you know, written in 1913, right. published until his death. It, 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 he or she was not published. It was not that she... No, she decided not to. She it, would not have allowed the publication. But uh, was it her idea that... that at some point after her death, this material would be published? Because she didn't destroy it, right? She didn't destroy it, and on, on the manuscript for the novel Asphodel, mm -hmm. um, she did write in big words, destroy. She wrote destroy, but didn't destroy it. She didn't destroy it, <laughs> and she had developed this relationship with Norman Holmes Pearson, the professor at Yale in American mm -hmm. Studies, uh, which is very important to her because he, he, she met him during World War II, and he was very busy collecting manuscripts of Pound and other modernists um, and then H.D. for Yale. Mm -hmm. he, he is the foundation of the Beinecke collection, mm -hmm. probably not in Harlem Renaissance. I don't know the history of how Beinecke got all the Harlem Renaissance stuff, but of the modernists of, um, of European or American uh, extraction, he, he was collecting their papers. So he he said, I'll take care of these things. And so she would say in her writing, well, I have this sh shelf at Yale. Yes. And so she sort of knew it was being preserved, um, but she would not have allowed the publication of, of this material. I think. But, but can we explain it? She didn't want it published. She wrote Destroy, <laughs> but didn't. Do you, do you right. see what I'm asking? Yeah. There had to have been some kind of eye toward a distant posterity. I think so. She just didn't think mm -hmm. what... The, the well, present moment was ready, right? Or why? I mean, what? Why did? Why did she disallow? What? what, what? Well, and in, in the, I mean, she grew up at a time with the story of Oscar Wilde, mm -hmm. of course, who, who, yeah. who which was is hounded, right. and eventually dies. Um, right, and, and and the story of Radcliffe Hall, of course, in 1928. Um, so even though in Bloomsbury in London, there was a lot of bisexuality and a lot of right, currency lot for that of kind of thing. Too. There was also there were laws against it, and she was, she was she um, was yeah. she was not about to be um, put things in print that right. sort of she didn't. Yeah. So in that sense, like Forster, I think she was in her own circles less in a closet than Forster. Right. She's much more open. 
um, with her sexuality within her circles, but she didn't like it in print. print. So she had this huge body of work that dealt much more openly with sexuality than any of the poetry, um, except for one poem called The Master, which is about Freud, which she <laughs> You don't know. say. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, this was also a, a poem about sexuality and her, her fight with him over sexuality, mm -hmm. and she did not publish that poem, would not allow it to be published. Well, to, to move uh, from H.D. to your work as a, as, yeah. as a whole, and, uh, what's the next um, place that you, you land? What, what are you doing in mapping that, that it seems um, to me so exciting that is, um, how did you get there? How did, what, what was the project and uh, could you talk a little bit about, mm, about sure. that? Well, I have had, since 1975, a joint appointment in the English department and the Women's Studies program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this meant I had responsibilities in interdisciplinary teaching on the one hand and in the English department on the other hand. And during the 1980s, I felt very schizophrenic, like I couldn't keep up in either field because yeah. I was half... And my colleagues in English were teaching four courses in English and I was only teaching two. How could, I just could not keep up with all the changes. And both fields are, are changing really fast. <laughs> They're changing the very, very yeah. fast. So, and I had young kids at the time. It just felt uh, huge, like a struggle. But wh what I realized is that, in fact, um, by having these two very different areas of expertise, interdisciplinary women's studies and feminist theory, and on the other hand, English literature, modernism in particular, that they were going to um, feed into each other. Mm -hmm. At some point, they were going to <laughs> integrate in, in a very exciting way. So I started to write um, some of the feminist theory essays that were coming out of, of the battles within women's studies, particularly about how to talk about identity. Um, mm -hmm. As it became more and more clear that you can't talk about women solely in terms of gender, Mm -hmm. But you have to incorporate how women's lives are raced, how they're classed, how they're related to national identity, religion, and so forth, sexuality, that um, we have to re-theorize re what identity means and how we talk about it. So I began writing about those issues, um, and that's really where, where the, the book Mappings right. comes from, um, is how to retain... Uh, some sense of what it means to write about women as a category at the same time that we incorporate the um, insights of post-structuralist theory which are sort of unsettling mm -hmm. any kind of categories at all and how how also women of color um, and their very important theory in the 1980s unsettle the category of women so I, I was trying to figure that out um, at the same time that I was working as a modernist. And so I uh, was uh, actually working, I got an ACLS grant to do a book on modernism in the early 1990s, and I set that aside because the, I wanted to do the essays that, that mm -hmm. took shape as the book Mappings. And so I guess, and then after I finished Mappings, I went back to modernism, and I've been working uh, on modernism there's, since then. There's another parallel here that, that strikes me as, as interesting, and, and, and part of the central story of what's happened in our world the last quarter century. That is, in both women's studies with, with the idea of gender, and with, in modernist studies, what you, you were basically doing was de-essentializing the, the principal mm -hmm. idea. What does it mean to be mm -hmm. a woman or a man? What does it mean uh, to talk about a modernist mm -hmm. text? You had some things to say about this at the first MSA, too, but we don't have to go there right now. <laughs> um, that's, that's, a, that's the essential yeah. intellectual struggle of the, in the humanities of the, of the last generation, don't you think? I think so, and I think that I was, I, I was uh, in the mid-90s at the Institute for Research in the Humanities, so I was being exposed to not just interdisciplinary women's studies, but to people from anthropology, geography, history, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more generally. And uh, I just had revelation after revelation from that um, very multidisciplinary um, mm -hmm. environment. In particular, it was as I was presenting this, these sets of issues about how to think about women's identity, 
in spatial terms um, as the intersection of different things. This anthropologist stood up in the middle of my talk and he said, don't you realize we're dealing with these things in anthropology? <laughs> <laughs> he interrupted me and I said, why, don't you understand what cultural mimesis is? And I said, no, I, you know, I hadn't read any of these things. And he gave me a whole list of things to read, namely people like James Clifford mm -hmm. um, as a key, uh, uh, um, key writer, his essay, Traveling Cultures from 1992. Um, absolutely transformed the way I thought about literature, the way I thought about gender, uh, and... Explain the transformation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I was struggling with at the time was I thought that, that the way feminists talked about different uh, identity is that all we could focus on was how different women were from each other. There was a very important political reason why we had to confront that not all women are the right. same because they're women. Women are differently... Uh, related to each other by other identity categories like race, like class, like sexuality, and so forth. So that's, but I was saying that there are, isn't there still a way to talk about some things that women have in common? Mm -hmm. And if, we, if there isn't, then um, we don't have women's studies anymore. Right. Right. <laughs> the category women's literature, the category women's studies right. vanishes if we, if we don't find that. And um, the, uh, the concept, concept in anthropology of cultural mimesis is a concept that's, that, that talks about the human species drive to imitate as being just as important as the human species drive to differentiate. Mm -hmm. So that identity, as anthropologists see it, is, is, is a combination, a kind of dialectic of uh, identifying one's group as different from that group, mm -hmm. and there, and also um, identifying a group by understandings of sameness. So I was trying to reintroduce the concept of sameness or mm -hmm. mimesis, imitation, back into feminist theory and literary studies, and not this kind of endless differentiation of all the different groups. That was very controversial, and um, I had some and very wonderful. <laughs> but isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it delightful too, though? That the notion of mimesis comes to us from Aristotle, right? Yes. So it comes from yes. our world. Representation. The social scientists understood the import yeah, of that right. before we did. Yes. <laughs> oh. I know that was to me that was a revelation. Well, not uh, all anthropologists no. themselves as social scientists. <laughs> but also the idea of mimesis means that it's it's a deliberate and mm -hmm. an active process and not an essence, not a something right. that you're born with. And that That's was right. that was really right. crucial. I think anthropology has been really crucial it's been for me. Absolutely when when yeah. I was a graduate student we were also reading Clifford Geertz. Yes. Um, th that was a big moment. That was, mm -hmm. We're talking the 80s now, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So move us up in time to uh, well to now. And, yeah. and, and to young women now, and, and uh, uh, where feminist studies is at this point in time, where women's study, studies is, uh, it's a it's a very different moment in time. The night, the, if, if you if you took the time from the nineties on, mm -hmm. uh, we've we've got a very different landscape. We do. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit, and uh, and where you are yeah. as? teacher in that landscape and, and thinker in that landscape? Well, I think that there are a lot of different things that are happening in women's studies uh, now. One has to do with the internationalization of women's studies. And some of my um, colleagues in political science and women's studies do work on feminism in Africa, feminism in mm -hmm. Asia. And uh, one woman in particular, Arlie Tripp, is... is very often publishing statements to the effect that the initiatives in feminism today are in the global south. Mm -hmm. That one of the things that happened in the West is that feminism got very navel-gazing, got so busy deconstructing, mm. so fixated again on these issues of difference, that um, they, the West is no longer any kind of leader in transnational feminist movements it's the leadership is in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, Eile Tripp uh, wrote an article that was published in Science in which she said while um, American feminists are um, fixated on difference, the women 
activists I talk with in Africa know that if they talked about all their differences, they'd just kill each other. Mm -hmm. So they are insisting in Africa, these because uh, Eileen studies um, African feminism, particularly East African. Um, these, uh, these women are, um, get together as activists, they form NGOs, national um, um, non-governmental agencies. Um, they pick up the uh, United Nations discourse on human rights mm -hmm. and they use the human rights conventions um, to do national work on feminist issues and transnational work on feminist And so that's where a lot of leadership is. Now, mm -hmm. That is not where feminism is in the United States and Europe. So it's a very... Um, well, when you say United States and Europe, yeah. do, you see, do you see that really as one, well, one conversation? It, no, it isn't entirely. But um, I find in the United States, the, many of the students in women's studies are um, very fixated on gender and sexuality. And it, mm -hmm. it's no accident, it seems to me, that many programs or departments in women's studies have changed their names to gender right. and sexuality or gender and women's studies or but sexuality is often in there and I, I I feel like a lot of the students that I see in our very strong women's studies uh, it's now called gender and women's studies department are are most interested in things that have to do with bodies right. they're interested in violence against women they're interested in women's health issues they're interested in childbirth they're interested in um, sexuality right. um, and they're not as interested in women in other parts of the world. Um, and I've, I've felt a little bit of tension in my own classes, and um, I've kind of withdrawn from some of the interdisciplinary classes and have asked women's studies to allow me to teach basically literature, mm -hmm. uh, feminist, feminist theory and literature, um, where I can do my transnational stuff because that's that's what I'm interested just, in. Just, yeah, to, no. I, 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 just to yes. ask one more question. <laughs> uh, you said what the preoccupation of American yeah. women uh, women and gender yeah. studies is. What are the preoccupations in the transnational conversation? What wh where does the where does <clears throat> where does that conversation um, Go just just to talk about that conversation. Well, I, I think that the that conversation, that transnational conversation, is is somewhat split um, by whether one's a social scientist or whether one's in the humanities. Yeah. Um, for social scientists like my friend Eileen Tripp, um, the the human rights issues and mm -hmm. and and uh, feminist organizing fem and policy around gender. Mm -hmm. um, in parts of the so-called third world are really critical issues. They might deal with AIDS, they might deal with the traffic in women, they might uh, deal with um, uh, e economic matters, for example, mm -hmm. economic and political matters. Um, over in the humanities, I think one of the major areas is thinking about diaspora, thinking about migration. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. the, uh, that's another whole direction my work has taken now. I teach courses in, um, in the English department in migration and diaspora studies, and mm -hmm. that's very transnational. But I do it as a feminist, and I'm very interested in women's writing. So um, sometimes I teach it as a straight feminist class. Sometimes it's feminist stuff is integrated into the stuff I do on migration now. So um, there's a lot of work in sort of global feminist art, uh, feminist film. Uh, cultural productions uh, that are kind of traveling cultures and the effects of globalization. Um, in, so I see that as a slight bifurcation of the social sciences and, and the humanities. Yeah. We were talking last week maybe and, and uh, you'd suggested to me that at, at this point in time there doesn't seem to be anybody theorizing mm -hmm. Um, was it gender that you said, in the, the sort of overarching way that, that uh, theorists were 30 years ago? But I didn't get a chance to hear mm -hmm. why you thought that was. Well, Is it related to what you were just saying? Did I think there's, okay. there's gender theory, and I should be clear about that. There's, there's quite a bit of gender theory, and it's very tied in with theorizing about sexuality. But there is hardly any, if any, theorizing about gender and literature. So it's, there, it's, it's feminist literary theory mm 
that has nearly vanished. Um, and I was talking with Toral Moy about this, and yeah. she she was very exercised about it. And why? <laughs> because I don't mean why was she. Yeah, yeah, why, was she, why? Yeah, why? Because in, in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, feminist literary theory was the avant-garde right. of feminist theory. Right. Um, and now there just isn't any feminist literary theory being produced at all. Um, why? Uh, and. I don't have the answer to that, and I don't know it is, what, it's what a very interesting it's question. Totally what in fact could be written. Um, is there something I should be writing? I did. I, w I took part on a panel of the uh, British Women Writers Association meetings. Now they they do come up only to 1900, but I was invited to be on a general plenary panel on the future of feminist criticism. This was a couple of years ago, and it's now coming out as a kind of dialogue. Um, with two other feminists. And what I tried to argue is, is the category women's writing is a different category than it was in when I started out. That women's writing was a legitimate category for Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar and Elaine Showalter because of, and centrally, because of the oppression of women. That's what justified bringing all these different women from different historical periods and societies together into a category of women's writing. But and I now so influential and oh. so so broadly. I mean, yeah. that is uh, amongst undergraduates generally. Right. They they really Don't. changed the world. They did. You know, so. And and wrote literary theory. Right. And doing you know it's the the opening section of Mad Women in the Attic, first hundred and four pages, is uh, a fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, literary theoretical statement, right. and then there's Helene Seek Sue, you know, writing The Laugh right. of the Medusa is still right. an absolute classic. I still teach that essay. Yeah. Me too. Um, and so well, is Virginia Woolf. I mean, A Room yeah. of One's Own um, is still a yes. classic of feminist literary theory. So it was these ideas that were, were turning upside down a nature of culture and women's relationship to it. Um, and we don't have that kind of theorizing um, going on anymore. So. You're visiting t tomorrow with, with my theory class, yeah. and I, I invited you to name two readings to introduce those students <laughs> to the question of, of um, theorizing gender in the context of, of literary production. And you named Virginia Woolf's Profession for Women and Adrian Rich's... Um, My Secret to the Silence. Well, When We Dead Awaken. When We Dead Awaken. That's, Writing that's as what Revision. It was. Right. I'm yeah. sorry, it's yeah. in Lies. It is in Lies, on Lies, but, Secrets and yes. Silence. Um, those are wonderful essays, powerful essays. But that you named these two pieces from right. a while ago. Right. Suggest your point. Yeah, I, I, could, I right. can't think of something to tell you to read that's current that deals specifically with literature or with representation unless it's about popular culture. It's, it's, there's a lot of feminist really theorizing good. about it's popular really culture, good. about mass yeah. culture, but not about literature. You know, what would the 21st century of Annette Kolodny be? You know that, I don't know. That, yeah. You know that essay where she, she yeah. basically just charts all the different things that are happening and yeah. with regard to... Um, yeah. Well, as I look at feminist criticism today, because there's a lot of very wonderful feminist criticism today, feminist criticism is intersecting with other very powerful um, areas of inquiry. For mm -hmm. example, bioculture studies. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's wonderful feminist criticism, and some of my students are doing it too, on women writers, for example, or male and female writers around issues of transgender, mm -hmm. uh, queer stuff. Um, another area is uh, the transnational migration. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely wonderful stuff coming out on uh, women's writing and diaspora. Um, another um, area is environmental uh, studies. So it's it's like I, I see as I see feminist criticism being born, it was always interacting with other methodologies. It's feminist psychoanalytic criticism, feminist. Um, uh, biographical criticism, feminist formalist criticism, and today the same thing is happening. It's taking areas of tremendous interest um, in literary and cultural studies and interjecting the, the feminist. So this is way in which feminist uh, theory, feminist criticism, women's studies has always had this kind of dialogic relation with other mm. modes of knowledge production, and I see that is happening um, now.
I want to take the conversation to one other place, but if you... If you well, I'm only yeah. concerned about time because we have to get Susan to her next, her next appointment okay. here. We, so, like, let, two let, minutes? Just one... I, yeah. I, uh, earlier, you talked about the, the state of humanities mm -hmm. uh, in, in the academy at this yeah. moment in time. And I'd, I'd love it if, in, in conclusion, you talked a little bit about the importance of the humanities for um, the academy and for students, our students at this moment. <laughs> let's in. sound that note. <laughs> yeah, well, let's sound that note. Well, I'm passionate about that note since I'm directing yeah. a humanities institute. Um, I, the, uh, I, I like to get rid of the notion of the humanities as an ivory tower. Uh, as a world apart, as something separate where w what our main task is to do is to preserve the great traditions of the past. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a very um, negative way of viewing the humanities. I would rather see the humanities as an exciting mode of new, new knowledge production. And what is the new knowledge that we produce? We are continually producing new ways of understanding how human beings have understood their world. Mm -hmm. that I, I see the humanities as uh, a collection of different disciplines that look at how human beings have made sense of the world through mm -hmm. art, through literature, through film, through philosophical ideas, um, through different forms of cultural production, whether it's culture with a big C, like what we see in museums, mm -hmm. um, or culture with a little C, which has to do with how people live their lives what cultural anthropologists study. Um, so that so this is a newness, but not a distance from. Not, not a distance. And I like to see how the humanities can combine with the sciences and with the social sciences to be an extraordinarily important component of, of how knowledge um, is, uh, has its presence in the world and mm -hmm. what difference it can make. I have uh, had a meeting with our provost, our new provost, who's a scientist. Uh, from the medical school, and he really does not have much experience with the humanities. He thinks the humanities is going to a concert and listening to a pianist. He doesn't have a, a sense of, can't make a distinction. It's very common among scientists, can't make a distinction between the arts and the humanities. So he asked to speak with me for an hour, and um, I asked him if I could read him a poem. <laughs> and I, I um, had him read a poem uh, by Moja Kaf, who's a Syrian-American poet. She has a series of very funny hijab poems about the headscarf. And uh, they're really poems about epistemology, how we know. And I argued to him that uh, all those wonderful discoveries that you people make in the medical sciences, you can't, those discoveries cannot enter society unless people understand culture, uh, unless they understand how people understand their health, their bodies, um, what they can do, what they can't do. And he, he understood that. Yeah, you know, he really got that because as a scientist, he's very frustrated. They produce all these wonderful things and then uh, some group comes along and says, you can't use that, it's against God. You know, he, just, he doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. The humanities is absolutely central to um, social policy, to um, scientific knowledge because it's we are the ones who work with the psychologies and the cultures of human societies, uh, the human mind, so that we're a very essential component, part, I believe, of what it means to try to make the world a better place. Um, Let's stop right there. That's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so Susan. Much. Thank you for the conversation.